So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ICBT Friday discussion group. Uh, we're a group of clinicians in all different stages of learning ICBT. And I really appreciate this has been a great space for co-learning and contributing to each other. It's a great community. Um, and we're sharing this information with OCD providers worldwide. So it's kind of exciting. Thank you for being a part of that. Uh, I'm Mary Hasbro, and I'm one of the co-facilitators with the um, for the discussions along with Margaret McCall and Sylvie Levine. And we're currently having panel discussions focused on using each of the ICBT modules with clients. So today's panelists are Amanda Petrick Gardner, Tori Morley, and Jeremy Schumann, and they're going to be discussing module three, the obsessional story. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we get started. If you have questions during the presentation, uh, please type them in the chat and then we'll pause between each of the presenters and answer questions. And then after the three panelists have done their short presentations, uh, then we'll be able to open it up for more questions and discussion. Um, this is being recorded. So please uh, refrain from asking any client specific questions. Uh, during the recording, and the recording will be added to the ICBT online website. So thank you so much to everyone for being here, and especially our panelists. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda uh, to start introductions, and then after you do introductions, feel free to just roll right into your um, presentation. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Amanda. I am an OC specialist in the state of Kansas, but licensed in about seven states. I am on the board for OCD Kansas, an affiliate of the IOCDF, and nothing much else interesting about me. So, Tori, go ahead. Um, my name is Tori, and I work in a private practice in Arizona. I am an OCD specialist and a trauma specialist. So I do both. Um, I am not on any special boards or anything. I just love what I do. And I'm Jeremy Schumann. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I work for a group private practice um, where I am also an OCD specialist, surprise, surprise, mm -hmm. and uh, get to supervise one person and have a little training program where I've trained a bunch of therapists, mostly in how to do ERP instead of ICBT. Um, and, and that's me. I'll pass it back to Amanda. Okay, so each of us is just gonna take a little bit of time sharing our thoughts on module three, mostly how we use it with clients, any specific tips or exercises we like. I figure since I'm going first, I would give a brief, a very brief just kind of summary of what module three is, especially if anybody's kind of new or in here. So module three is the module on obsessional debt or the obsessional story, I should say. It's when we teach our clients the obsessional story that their OCD is telling them. It's why we get pulled into this doubt and feel like it is so real and scary and convincing. It's because OCD is obviously saying something very elaborate and scary. So I think each presenter today will give a little bit of feedback or tidbits on how they create the obsessional story. I know Tori's going to talk about how she does it and Jeremy's going to talk about some bridging exercises. I, I go from obviously module two is where we identified all that reasoning, all the facts and possibility and hearsay and take that and combine it with a lot of other detail to say, here's what OCD is telling you. And so as I'm describing this, I like to use an example that they are not inferentially confused about. Sometimes just starting right off with theirs can feel, again, a little, little too scary, a little too real, or they have a tough time knowing where I'm going with this. So I like to give an example that doesn't bother them. And I'll share one of those examples. If they're not having troubles with contamination, I might use a contamination example that I've actually experienced and I kind of inquire like, hey, are you, are you fearful of being around trash cans or being around the air above trash cans? And most clients look at me like, no, Amanda, <laughs> that doesn't bother me. If it does bother them, then I usually use another example. And I kind of know that going into it, depending on what their themes are. But so I tell them about this doubt of mine about being around the air above and around a trash can. And I share them my story that I'd written up. 
based on all the reasonings that I had done in module two. So here's my story I share with them. I believe the air above the trash can is dirty and will contaminate me or contaminate other items around it. I can physically see that the trash can is dirty. It is disgusting. There's rotting foods inside. I can smell the items in the trash can and it's going bad. I know that germs can be airborne. So even if I do not physically touch the garbage, I could still be contaminated from these airborne germs. I have a visceral reaction whenever I'm directly above the trash can opening. I even know other people that have the same fear. So it is absolutely possible that the air is contaminated and now I am too. So there's my example. Again, most clients, I, I kind of inquire like, okay, now are you pulled in? Now do you believe me? Like, this is awful. <laughs> and now they're not sucked in, but they can kind of see where I'm coming from. Like, okay, now that we hear that, we can at least see, Amanda, why that has bothered you. So then we lead, take that and lead to their story. And just to pause for a second, I love module two, module three, because I think it is so validating for what they experience for years and through many providers or people in their world. They've been told this is crazy. This is illogical. This is ridiculous. Why would you think this, right? There's no reason for this. These thoughts are random. Just ignore it. And these couple modules, I feel like really help validate the fact that like, you're not crazy. This actually makes a lot of sense. Every obsessional story I have heard from clients, I have a little part of me that's like, wow, I totally get it. I get why you were sucked into this. Like hearing all your reasonings, like makes sense. And I think that's so validating for a client to hear that it's like, I'm not insane for thinking this, or this is not random. There's actually a lot to this. So that's kind of where I start when I'm building my story. I give that example to help them understand why it would be easy to believe a story with that much detail. And then we begin constructing theirs, which again, I'm going to pause there because I'm going to let Tori and Jeremy eventually explain more information about constructing their stories. And I'm going to give a couple exercises I often do at this point in treatment. Um, Actually, the first one was about my trash can story. So I go through that exercise. The second one, just to demonstrate this idea of stories and how multiple stories can exist and how they can evoke different feelings and how some of them you can write off and some of them you can really get consumed by. I use the example, um, I share some different pictures and let them create stories about it. So I'm gonna try sharing my screen and pull up a story. All right. Actually, I'll pull up this image. Can everybody see that image of the two guys talking? Perfect. I'm going to ask for some lovely volunteers. Can anyone just unmute for a second and tell me a happy story about this image? Don't be shy. Okay. These two guys are talking and um, one is just telling the other one about this awesome date he just went on. And, um, the other one's super interested and is super excited for him because he's been nervous about going on dates and he finally went on one and it went great. I love that. Was that Angela? I think I saw her picture pop up. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So there's one story. Pretty believable. We could hear that and be like, okay, yeah, that feels pretty good. Anybody else willing to unmute and tell another story? You can decide. It can be a sad one. It can be a scary one. It could invoke, invoke anger. Okay, just because this is funny, maybe because I just said the other one. So these two guys are talking. Um, the one had been waiting to go on a date forever. And he was super excited to tell the other guy about the date. And um, they've been working together on what they could say. But then when the other one tells <laughs> the other guy about the date, he realizes that that was the girl that he wanted to go out with. Nice one. He is very surprised, as you can see on his face. Mm -hmm. That's just me. That's perfect. So kind of a sad one there. Ironically funny too, given your first example. So just for fun, let's do one more picture, even though y'all get it. Okay. Let me share this. And who can tell me a happy story about this dog and somebody in the background? 
this dog um, is normally on his leash all the time and he doesn't get to play with other dogs very often and his owner just allowed him off the leash and he saw another dog and so he is bolting to go and play with this other puppy. I love it. Stephanie, I should have known you were going to volunteer for the dog one. <laughs> Absolutely. That is a happy story. Okay. Who can tell another story? Sad story, scary this dog had the same experience that Stephanie just described and is running through the field, but also running towards a road. And his owner behind him can see that the dog is going to run out into the road and the owner is chasing him saying, Fido, no, come back, stop, stop. I'll just leave it at that. Mary, that's a horrible, that's a horrible story, Mary. Is yes. it worse? The first thing that came to my mind was like, he's about, he's out of, a kill shelter and he's about to be put down and he escaped and they're just about to catch him and take him back like that was my first thought like there's my sad one so sorry stephanie what's wrong with you people i know that's the exercise <laughs> so we even saw a great example how it evokes some emotion in stephanie there just by changing the story just by changing all the little details of it even though it's the exact same picture so i think this kind of sets up for future modules really helping our clients see that like multiple stories can exist. All of those stories you guys just gave examples of were built in the imagination, right? There's nothing in this moment that tells us that this is what is happening. So that is where we're going with our clients is helping them better understand these stories. They're built in the imagination and eventually coming to the point that they can create a story though that is based in reality, that uses a lot of reality information or common sense or other details to make that story seem more convincing. But that comes later down the road. Um, I don't wanna talk about the counter story quite yet, but how about after all the presenters go, if we have time and people wanna hear about the counter story or maybe one of the other panelists is gonna talk about it, we can include that today if you guys want. But I will go ahead and pause there and let, if there's any questions we can do those or we can let Tori go. I don't see any questions yet. In the um, pregame chat, there were lots of topics and discussion and questions about counter story. So if, if we can circle back to that, that might be helpful, but that's fine to move on for now. Perfect. We'll do counter stories after Jeremy. Okay. So um, I do what Amanda said is all great. I do so much of that stuff. Um, I, Bronwyn has made this wonderful PowerPoint of story, storytelling, and it's similar to what Amanda just talked about, where you have pictures and you tell different stories about the same pictures. And I definitely use that um, when I'm helping my clients construct their story. But I need to go back a little bit and um, tell a little bit about my experience with OCD so that you can understand why I do what I do when I'm teaching the story. So I did not know hardly anything about OCD until I was about 50 years old. And all three of my children were then diagnosed with OCD. And I'm like, how could I have raised three children and not known that they had OCD? So I began to research it and study it. And as I decided that I wanted to be an OCD therapist, and as I did this, I thought, oh, I do all of these things and didn't know I had it. And so then I learned ERP and I was doing that. And a year ago, almost to the date, I joined this group on Facebook, <clears throat> stalked it for a while, bought the book. And when I bought the book, I thought, oh, this is like an autobiography of my brain. It just made so much sense to me. And what I realized is that when I was a kid and I would tell my mom all of these stories that I had in my head, all these fears, my mom would just say, wow, what an imagination you have. And when I'd say, well, but mom, but it could really happen. And my mom, you have to know my mom, <laughs> this worked out well for me, but she would say, well, it's possible I could drop dead today, but you don't see me sitting in my rocking chair, wringing my hands, waiting for it to happen. Now go out and play. And so essentially what she did is she taught me these skills that we teach in ICBT. I knew that the stories I was had in my head, I was making them up. I knew that just because it was possible didn't mean I needed to stop living my life. And so now here I am. And so when I have a client come in, one of the things that I have realized is that they tell you their stories from day one. 
So I listen for their stories from day one and I make notes. And so by the time I get to the third module, I have most of their story already no noted because I find that clients have a hard time really coming up with their story when they're not in the bubble. So we'll do module two and they have some, you know, a week or two, depending on the client to really get all the facts and rules and experiences and all of these things. And then we get to constructing the story. That's where I'll do the um, storytelling PowerPoint where they understand that stories affect us and how um, the details make us feel different ways and view things differently. And then when they start to construct their story, I have pretty much the whole story already noted. And I realize they don't have a lot of the things they've already told me written down. And so they have a hard time really making the story flow. And we talk a lot about flow. Like we have a list of things, but that doesn't really get them in the bubble. And why not? It doesn't because they haven't made it cohesive. And so sometimes I'll draw circles and we'll put in all the facts and rules and experiences and I'll have them figure out what they're filling in between the circles to make it flow. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, as they tell me all these things, I'll say, well, remember that story you told me about such and such? I wonder if that's something that also is in your mind. They go, oh yeah, 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 that's in there. And so then I've, so now I've got all this information that I've been gathering the last, you know, however many sessions that I'm just kind of saying, oh, I remember you told me this. What about this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So then what I'll do is if I have a client that has a hard time making a, making a story, because there are some clients that struggle with this, um, I'll ask them if, it, if it's okay if I took one of their obsessive doubts and constructed a story for them and for them to tell me, am I getting this right? Do I need to change this? Like to stop me in the middle. And because stories is what I do really well, I can hear people's stories. Like I said, this this book, it spoke like my brain speaks. So I can construct somebody's story. Now I have all this notations and all of the things, and all I'm careful that I use their language. That's really important. Use their phrases and their words. And I will then tell one of their obsessive stories as they've told it to me. And they'll just sit there for a minute. And I think, wow, how did you get into my brain? Um, but then I just tell them, well, I'm just telling you the story that you've already told me. And it's a pretty powerful moment for them when they realize that all of this stuff is going around in their brain and that they are acting on this story as though it's happening right now. And then we talk a little bit about um, inferential confusion and just we briefly cover some of those things that I know we cover more in later modules um and like Amanda was saying we all talk about could it also be possible that this other story maybe is true too and so I, I don't argue with the thing because for me I understand how real it feels in the moment but helping them see that okay, I see this. And, and when you draw the circles and you have them fill in the gaps, they see how they've really kind of had to make stuff up to make the story seem real. And um, that helps them kind of step back and look at it. So one of the things I think when I'm doing this is that this is all about getting people to notice what is going on in their minds and to be curious about it rather than being afraid of it. And that helps my clients really start to be willing to explore it a little bit more because most of the time they're just like, no, I don't want to go there. I'm afraid to go there. No. Um, so some of the impacts that this is, I asked a couple of my clients if I, if they would tell me the impact that learning about their story has had on them. And they gave me a few of my clients gave me permission to share some of the things that they said. Um, one client said, it helps me to see that I was just connecting things together that didn't really go together and to see how it made my obsessional doubt feel so real. Um, another one said, it helped me to realize that OCD was a figment of my imagination and that it was no different than anything else. It was just linked to doubt and fear. It helped me trace it back to when it started and how it evolved. 
I was able to map it out and understand it better. It helped me to identify it and see it, which helped me stop everything OCD was telling me to do. And then one of my favorites, I have a 14 year old client that um, she said, OCD puts the believe in make believe. And I think that's a pretty profound thing for a 14 year old to say. Um, so then the last thing that I'll say before I turn it over to Jeremy or see if there's any questions is um, because I treat trauma, I have quite a few clients that have complex PTSD as well as OCD. And just as a mention on what I've noticed with that, um, again, this is no research or anything. This is just things I notice in my office is that um, OCD often acts as a protector for people who have had complex PTSD. And often what I see is that it's their behavior can often be protective, like checking the doors to make sure they're locked so no one can get in. Sometimes it's a distractor. It's much easier for me to think about my hands being dirty and overwashing my hands than it is for me to think about the bad thing that's happened to me. And sometimes it's a fixer. If I can just get things right, then everything will be okay. And so sometimes when I'm working with people that have both, I have to work with this part of the OCD, like find, figure out its um, purpose before they, I really can start working with the OCD. And so sometimes it's not linear when you have trauma and OCD, it's kind of messy versus people that come who only are coming for OCD. Um, so with that, I think that's all I have to say. So if there's any questions, I'll take those or otherwise I'll turn it over to Jeremy. There was a question in the chat and a couple people have responded in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and ask anyway. Um, so Erica asks, given Amanda's example of a contamination story, what are strategies to use with clients who have sticky brains and are worried that they will now start to obsess about garbage cans where they didn't before? So creating the doubt where there, where there was none before. Um, so any of the panelists, if you want to answer. I was, oh, sorry, I was going to say, I, I should have mentioned my comment. I've had it happen so many times that clients did worry about that. I just haven't actually had them pick up a new theme just from hearing about it. But I usually then bring that into dis that discussion of our obsessional doubt, because what they are displaying in front of you in that very moment is an obsessional doubt. What if I could catch a new theme? What if I could hear something and now worry about it? So I usually bring it up in the context of the treatment we're all doing, saying, oh, that sounds like another obsessional doubt. Like, And then we're probably going to address that. As far as it actually happening, I haven't seen it. And if you guys know me, I'm probably going to continue forward and talk about the dirty trash can because I don't want to be part of that compulsive cycle saying, okay, I won't talk about it. I don't want you to get this theme. So if anything, I'm going to move forward and continue doing it, but now bringing in that new doubt to our work. Thank you. And a, then in the chat, a, oh, go comment. ahead, Jeremy. Can I respond to that one as well? Yeah. That, um, you know, I think also we know our clients BST, maybe not completely at this point, but you're not likely to pick up an obsession that doesn't brush up against your own reasoning process. And so, you know, you're intentionally picking one that they don't have. They're not that vulnerable to picking this up as an obsession. And I think we would all use our common sense if it was something that was going to feel like really aversive or painful to the client. We might pick something obviously that was going to be a little bit less so that they're not totally immersed um, in, in their own stuff at this point in the, uh, in the learning. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeremy. And that might be also an opportunity to start introducing some of the selectivity that we start to see as well, you know, like pointing that out, like, you know, um, how they are not likely to, to pick up that doubt because of the vulnerable self theme then. I think that's the only other question at this point. So let's go ahead and move on to Jeremy and then we'll see if there's more questions. All right. Um, one of my most compelling learning moments in learning this was um, how the, the cinema analogy has developed and developed and developed as, a, as I've heard it used. Um, so you guys will all remember that if you're in a movie theater and it's dark all around you and the screen is huge and you're just drawn into this immersive experience you can get very absorbed in the imagination of the screenwriter as he's 
displaying it out all in front of you. And if it's a scary movie or if it's an exciting movie, your heart races, you experience the emotions of the people um, who are in the movie. And it's because of these immersive qualities about the movie that you get so sucked in. And um, if you were a movie director, if you're a cinematographer, if you have directed and, and uh, created the backdrop for tons of horror movies and you go to a horror movie, you don't see it the same way that someone who is naive to horror movies see it. You don't get sucked in because you say, oh, I see the director made this choice here that he felt that that would be more scary, more immersive. Oh, I hear that the musician made this choice here because it was going to be more scary, more immersive. I see this color choice. I see the pacing. I see all these tricks that are supposed to pull you into the movie. And it is going to just change your experience, sort of uh, maybe a defused experience from what that is, or uh, more uh, self as context or something experience of what that is. And um, what we're training folks to do is to think like a cinematographer, is to think as I see my story constructed, what elements did my OCD put together in what particular way to make this so uh, absorbing and immersive? Um, so as I'm leading up to the actual exercise where we're gonna create these stories, I, I really love that cinematographer. I'm gonna train you to be a cinematographer. As we create your story here, we're gonna make it as immersive as possible. And then after we do that, we'll sort of pick apart what made it so immersive? How, what were the particular tricks? What tricks does your brain play on you? So that, that's one point I like to make. Another thing I wanted to say is that narrative is not rumination. I know we did actually touch on this uh, two weeks ago when we covered module two, that rumination often is full of like consequences and aversion to these um, emotional experiences that are with it. Uh, and those things are not necessarily part of the reasoning process. Um, and so as uh, I really loved what Tori said about on day one, people come in and they want to tell their stories and we can be recording this. So we're already maybe starting to uh, sort things out into what is the reasoning and then what is sort of just the lamenting about the, the symptoms that we have. Uh, so if clients are getting confused as they're writing their narrative because they're putting in a lot of consequences, that just might be something to point to. A third point that I wanted to make here is that um, when we talk about constructing obsessional narratives as being the thing that convinces you to be in the bubble, I, I myself had gotten sort of confused about that, thinking that maybe there's this like stream of automatic thoughts that is the obsessional narrative, and that if, when you hear it, uh, that's what completely sucks you into the bubble. In some ways, there's that's sort of true, that there's these little units of narrative where, where you get sucked in. But as we write out, you know, we're connecting all the reasons from their module two, um, it's going to be probably a little bit more comprehensive, a little bit more put together than the way that they were naturally experiencing it. They're getting, you know, a run of reason in their automatic thoughts, followed by image, followed by consequence, followed by lamenting back to the reasons. And it's just a little bit more disjointed. But as what we're doing is we're taking like the reasoning and we're putting it all together. And um, what that's going to serve to do is that's going to really slow down their reasoning process so they, they see how they arrived here. It's like, it's gonna make it obvious that they put together a reasoning process to get there. And what better way to sort of laugh at or see the silliness of your reasoning process than making it so obvious like that, writing it out in like a paragraph form the way our brain does not naturally think. Um, so sometimes I'm describing the, the narrative to clients. They're like, I don't know, I, don't, I can't tell you exactly what my narrative is. And it maybe helps to, to remember it's not going to be everything all strung together like that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll talk about uh, bridging a little bit here. But the way I want to talk about bridging is actually that we, we in the cl clinician handbook, the word bridging shows up in the module three stuff for the first time, but it doesn't really get explained at all. In module nine, when we start talking about these alternative stories, that's where bridging is going to be more defined and uh, the, the actual like bridging game of two things that are unrelated in a narrative that feels compelling um, is, is explained there. But I think it's very useful here in module. Three. I think the main reason to include it maybe with module nine instead of module three is that there's an assumption that it's 
fairly easy to put together your obsessional story, but we have many tools. We can use the uh, that bridging game learning experience to say, is this something that helps us put together this, this narrative where it starts to feel more compelling? Um, and um, the, the module nine stuff and the module three stuff being far apart does have a, a function in that you can like learn all the reality sensing stuff at, um, before you go into trying to convince yourself of, of what uh, your authentic identity is. But there are a lot of other sort of tricks that are in the module nine stuff that maybe are useful. So for example, where Amanda was talking about creating an obsession for the first time, module nine includes in it the famous your pen is a spy cam example where you create a narrative that um that well is my pen really a, a secret camera well uh, i could come up with some reasoning that uh, i found this and it was outside of uh, a, a government building and that i know spies going out you could create a narrative out of that it could fit just as well in module three so it's like just know you have some extra tools that you could pull out here if that's appropriate um, to get people thinking about it. And as I bring up that module nine is an alternative story, that is different than what a counter story is. So maybe this is a chance for me to pass that back to Amanda to explain what counter stories are and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't define bridging. Well, before I pass back to Amanda, Carl just put in the chat there. I guess I didn't explain what it is. Bridging is you take two things that are unrelated and through like launching off of the first point, you bring yourself into a story where you can talk yourself into believing that there is a connection between these two things. Um, the example in the book is something about uh, a person doing something, uh, uh, not a cat knocking over a beer and you, you create a whole story uh, that just justifies why the, the first action is related to the section, second action. And uh, OCD is doing this through sort of a reverse reasoning process. I feel scared. And so then I'm like, well, these things must be related. And then I figure out, well, how might they be related? And then the, the more detail I put into that bridge, the more I can involve sensory information um, and minor details that are uh, Sort of our convincing of the lie, uh, the more I, I really will get sucked into that and and start to believe in that connection. Okay, I'll pass it over. Okay, I'll add some about counter stories. So, the counter story is just another story to help show that multiple stories can exist, but some might be more realistic than others. I don't know who I can't remember who exactly said this, like this quote, but. It's to cast reasonable doubt on the obsessional doubt. That's how I like to remember it. Now, later on in the handbook, we will get to the alternate story, which is much more extensive, a lot more information, a lot more um, details in it. But the counter story, I like to think of it, to use my trash can example, we might come up with another story that just says, hey, my hands look clean. I must be okay after being around that trash can. It's used to help um, start showing that there could be another story here, right? Um, for any non ICB tiers, because I've had to have this discussion with many people, this is not cognitive restructuring or challenging. We're not using this as a new compulsion so that every time I have this trash can story, I just tell myself, my hands look clean, my hands look clean. That's not the purpose. We're not using it to replace the other story. We're just using to, again, emphasize the fact that this is another possible one. So I feel like it's a, it's a concept that's introduced in module three that we later go on to use more. What is that in nine about the different story or the alternate story. And again, in that module, we really create based on reality sensing and common sense and all these other details and make that one seem even more elaborate and convincing so that we are more likely to act on the real story. So that's how I use the counter story. But if anybody wants to add in anything, go ahead. I think that's how I use it as well. Can I use, um, can I bring in a client example? I know you said no clients, but I had prepared with a client to present something that we were working on this week. Can I pull up her obsessional story and kind of talk through our process of how we got there? Is that cool? Okay. 
I believe so. Yes. As long as you have your client's consent and Fred might jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but. <laughs> and this is not her like literal exact yeah. story either because. And it doesn't have her PHI on it. I assume things like that. No PHI on it. Yeah. How do I screen share? I lost Zoom. There we go. Uh, this one. Okay. So I had talked through module two um, at length. I think we did like four sessions on module two because this is someone who was struggling to speak for their OCD. They were doing a lot of coming into the consequence. And I was doing some of what um, Tori was talking about where I would say, well, how about this reason that you've given in the past that she wasn't able to pull out? And finally, you know, she had been taking notes in her notebook uh, as we've been talking. I said, I want you to put this together. I want you to try to put this into a narrative that starts to feel complete. And so she sends me this like two page document full of disjointed phrasing things. And a lot of it was rumination about how bad things would be if the doubt was true. Um, and so what I did is I copy and pasted everything usually in the black that she wrote um, and kind of put it into an order. So it was organized a little bit for her. And I added some of my own notes from uh, our conversations prior that added in some of the deep stuff that she had been talking about. And so this is like a pretty long narrative because she sent me a lot. So a lot of times they don't have to be this long. But this is kind of what it looks like, how I was able to take her words, but also it's, it's, it is collaborative. I'm adding my own knowledge about what makes good stories and um, helping her not just with content like, oh, you left out this piece about your mom and your dad, but also adding in like transition words and saying, I think that these pieces of the story go together. So I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll read her somewhat long story out so you can get another example of an obsessional narrative here. Um, we, we titled it, I'm a target for gossip. Uh, I think people are talking about me and my sexuality, that everyone thinks I'm gay, but I don't know it. I will hear, I think I hear, people say things, for example, like, yeah, she's married, or yeah, she just had a baby, or she thinks she's straight, and my anxiety will physically manifest, and it can happen anywhere. Like, as I sat there waiting for my daughter's basketball coach to wrap up the end of the game chat, and I heard two people behind me say, yeah, she's married, some things I choose not to understand. And I add in here, people try and tell me that I'm being paranoid and that they don't hear the things I hear, but I'm always eavesdropping more than other people, and I just catch more subtle things. I always hear something real uh, before I even start trying to figure out what they're talking about. And you can't trust people not to talk about you behind your back. People gossip. I will not be liked by everyone. People get hurt. People are misunderstood. And everyone these days talks so much about sexuality. They're always trying to put someone in a box or figure it out or put a label on them. There were rumors spread about me in middle school that I was a lesbian because I experimented with some girls in sixth grade. And my mom is the biggest, most judgmental gossip of all. People are always saying something negative about others. And it comes up all the time in social conversation. On top of that, they probably say I'm gay because I don't fit in with the other girls. There are people out there that are in the closet that are married with kids having a fake life. I've seen movies about it. I've heard people gossip about it. People probably assume that's exactly what's happening to my family. I've been told I come off like a dude because I talk loud, I cuss, I can be vulgar and gross. I play in a reggae band and smoke weed and I'm good with the hard to handle horses. I don't know what I do. I just know some people know, uh, don't know what to think about me because I say exactly what I'm thinking. I'm honest to a fault at times and I'm not the stereotypical perfect wife for mom and I've always been this way. My dad never really uh, thought I had my shit figured out and that's because I never really have. People see that, they know I'm different. That's why I check to see what people were talking about if I can't quite tell. I can't let people talk about me like they did in middle school. It just makes me feel lower than dirt. So you can see if you're following along with what I'm reading there, some of the blue was very much just elements to make it read better, to make it, you get wrapped up in it more. And upon reading back, this was like, oh yeah, this made me totally, it was a huge invitation to the bubble. And it just really obviates how we might feel okay in one minute. And then you get this immersive story and you are not okay. And how did I feel right before that story? I actually felt pretty certain about what was happening. We'd had this whole conversation about reasons where I was seeing through everything, but oh, you put it together like that. It's just an invitation to get absorbed and lost. So just wanted to share that example. 
I guess we could open it up. Jeremy, for any yeah, there's a question from Carl. Please explain how this is different from constructing a script for an imaginal exposure. Don't we already do this in ERP? Yeah, um, how do I unshare this before I do that? The way that that's different than constructing a script for imaginal exposure is imaginal exposure, the goal, the intent is to flood you with so much emotion and then through sitting with those feelings, you're supposed to habituate. Um, it's a very different intent here. Uh, we are not just trying to raise your emotion up as high as we can. We're trying to demonstrate the tools of the cinematographer. So though there might be sort of that evocative component of it, that we're not saying sit with that, deal with that. There's no certainty around that. We're saying, see how your OCD is tricking you here. Carl might even have more to add to that or uh, have uh, a different thought about it, but that's my impression. I, that was I, I, yeah, it was superb, Jeremy. Thanks. I would say also to cite what Jeremy is saying is that it's also what I was talking about as opposed to eliciting the fear and having them sit with it, it's having them be curious about it. And there's a different shift in it when you're creating it of curiosity, like, oh, what am I doing? Versus, oh, here's the thing I fear, now I need to be okay with it. I would briefly add, you know, it seems like with imaginal exposure, we are trying to accept the possibility that that horrible thing could be true. And with this deconstructing process that you are describing, we are trying to shine light on how actually in reality it's not true, even though we're not explicitly arguing that at this point or anything. But yeah, actually, I was I was looking in the as I was going back through the handbook to prepare for today. I, I find myself surprised at times when I come back in, into the handbook and I see the dialogues between therapist and client because there's certainly no like direct dispute and challenging, but as the client is telling the story, the therapist is sort of pointing out the, the gap in logic. Uh, there's something like, oh, so you're saying that because you're worried that you're, you're because uh, you care so much about other people, that that's a sign that you might be a psychopath. OK, I see. You know, and he, there's some of that in there that feels sort of disputational, but it's, it's not that, you know, what you said is wrong. It's just that I'm holding the mirror back up and that's what you just said to me. Right. And I can sort of give you a little bit of a raised eyebrow as I do that and without um, without going too far off course, because we are trying to, as Mary's saying, you know, have them have that experience of like, okay, I see what I just did here. Well, thank you so very much to all three of you for sharing your unique ways of um, exploring this with clients. Is it okay if we open up and just let people raise their hands or unmute and ask any questions or discussion even between the three of you or interacting with the participants here? Great. So I'm wondering then if anyone has any questions or comments that they would like to add, or if Fred, even if you have anything you would like to add. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I was just listening in the background, but I know great, great presentations and really well explained. Um, I, I think at this stage of the module, it's also about uh, the uh, assessment and getting clear what this whole narrative is about, right? Uh, and so, at this stage, you're not you're not really correcting the person in the sense of uh, pointing out the different reasoning devices necessarily, or even uh, showing how um, these these. Uh, the reasoning does not really justify the obsession because of the way of it is constructed. So I think the main thing I wanted to say, yes, there's no disputation in in, in uh, ICBT in terms of, of challenging the content of the narrative in itself, like the particular facts that are being brought up or the possibilities of being brought up. But later on in the therapy, what ICBT does do is show that there's something wrong with the process of reasoning there, which leads to uh, a faulty conclusion exactly because of the way the person arrives at that conclusion on the basis of, of, of a reasoning process that does not justify uh, uh, 
the obsession or the, or the primary affairs of God is not correct, incorrect in its content or in, in the fact that it's no, but it's the way it is it's constructed that is the problem. Uh, so in that sense, ICBT does challenge that, as Jeremy said, and you know, we see that in the book as well, you know, it's, uh, but not at this stage. Uh, it's about assessing and it's about realizing that there is a narrative behind it. You know? Later on, that, that, that comes is uh, like, like in the other slides that Amanda created about all the reasoning devices and the reasoning errors of the OCD, right? They are very relevant because it, they, they actually exemplify the uh, inferential confusion uh, uh, that is occurring uh, and what makes this, this confusion between imagination and possibility uh, possible to stop with. Right? By going beyond the senses, by dismissing what is really in front of you, by having all these irrelevant associations, by doing this bridging, uh, etc. You know, uh, even though it's not really justified either in the senses or in reality or or anything that is really part of the Persian reality. So that was my main comment. But um, uh, I'll let anybody else uh, comment as well. Uh, I think Teresa wants to say something too. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Fred, if you could maybe share a little bit about how you, um, how do you kind of like flow in with the client um, for the counter story? So, for example, in the manual on page 62, it talks about um, to eliminate the justification for the doubt, right? And so we're like, how do you kind of prompt a client in session to do a counter story without it being an alternative story? Well, I, I think like Amanda said in the beginning, the counter story is more about just, just showing the person to put some doubt, some reasonable doubt into the story to show the person that there, are, that there is an alternative story possible, just at, at least equally possible. You know? so don't forget people with OCD are so often uh, absorbed into their OCD, they, they almost like have difficulty come on, you know, coming up with any sort of like alternative story, even though they're or, or counter story, uh, even though they're all out there. So that's just an initial introduction to the power of narrative, but also to an initial introduction and that that's why it's called the counter story initially, but also an introduction to that that there are alternatives. You know, uh, don't forget because we all have different stories in our head. You know. Uh, that's really missing when it comes to many people with OCD. The alternative story has is simply not there, you know. Yet we do have one. So when we talk about okay, we're going to create a new story, is that sort of does that promote reassurance or does that promote that not something compulsive to that? Well, not really, because all of us have that story, an alternative story, or, or what is the real story, in fact, you know. Uh, and ultimately, the person does have to switch to that like uh, we all do when we don't have a particular obsession. We have to go into that direction. Um, does that answer your question a little bit, uh, Teresa, if I understand it correctly? Well, I'm wondering, for example, um, like I'm, I'm just trying to give um, clinicians like a very kind of like specific way that maybe you dialogue with a client where you say, we've got your OCD story here. Now, would you be willing to rewrite this using us like as uh, using your common sense here? Like, or some, like, what is it? Like, how do you transition a client where they have their OCD story right in front of them? And then how do you like verbally prompt them to engage in a counter story? Do you, like, uh, usually, how do you do that? Usually, I mean, everybody, I mean, there's, there's no strict formula. I mean, uh, the way I do it, I just provide an alternative story on the spot, you know? So, okay, so you think your hands are contaminated or you think that particular object is, is contaminated. Well, let me, let me give you another story, you know? Or I ask them to rate it, so how, how sure are you about that? And I ask, give them another story on the spot about why that particular object is not contaminated. Uh, and then I ask them, do you think that's as valid as the other story, you know? Or that it could be true as well. You know? And then I ask them, how do you now feel about your obsessional story? And it's either the same or it went down a little bit, you know? It's just an initial introduction to show that stories matter in terms of the emotions and the and the uh, and the uh, behavior that follows from them. 
Um, can I add a little bit of my thought there? Yeah, please. Um, how do you introduce a counter story? Well, if we've been doing the uh, the game where I show you one image and you tell me it one story in the other way, then you can say, you know, just humor me. What would the story be on the other side of this without having to be too poking at them? That might be one, you know, one kind of approach to it. And another thought with it, though, is if you have gone all the way through module three and they've created their obsessional story and it hasn't been voiced yet what the counter story is likely going to be like you are a saint because it's so hard to keep this stuff in a lot of times right like we're, we're not directly challenging and saying I disagree with you with your clients but it's the clients doubt means that there's they have their common sense and they're just doubting their common sense about it like we've given voice to the counter story before this point. Um, and I think in every case that I can think of, I can't think of a case where it would have been really a, a relationship uh, a violation or something like that for me to just suggest, just as Fred said, well, here's another way of seeing that. And that's what happens when clients go back and forth. Their counter story and their story is already mixed up together because they'll argue with themselves. So they already have a formulation of the counter story, right? I'm guessing this is probably pretty common, but how often clients are telling us, I know this isn't real. I know this isn't what's actually going on. I, I know my hands are clean. And they've just kind of identified the counter story right there. I've rarely had, I mean, I've never had a client that's just like, this is 100% absolutely true. They're usually verbalizing that counter story throughout the whole process. Well, yeah, you see that often in the fact that the obsession is ego dystonic, right? Uh, to start with. Uh, although that understanding often doesn't, they, they are aware of it on, a, on often, I think, not on a deep enough level as to why it does not make sense. So it's often expressed as part of a certain uh, a desperation, right? Why do I still think about this when I know uh, it doesn't make sense, you know? When you ask them, okay, now just take a step back and ask, and, and why do you think it doesn't make sense for real, you know? Or why does it make sense to other people? Then you go a little bit deeper and you get actually a story as to why the obsession may, uh, uh, not be true to start with, you know. So, so I think uh, they they do go th go through that in an obsessional way. It's going back and forth between uh, uh, an obsessional story and an alternative or a counter story, whatever you want to call it. You know, they do that automatically already, but they do it in a compulsive way. And there is a way of doing it without doing it in a compulsive way. And interestingly, once you pointed out, they know. They know when they're compulsive. They know when they're ruminating. They know when they try to escape the doubt. Versus uh, just really considering an alternative that is based in reality. And if you can switch the person, <clears throat> you often have to remind the person when you see them doing that. It's sort of like compulsive rumination. Uh, but uh, getting them out of that and being able to, to just consider the alternative or the real story that's based in the sentence that's what makes it real or based on the real self and just approach that on its own terms without this constant comparison with the OCD story. That's ultimately where you want the person to get to because that, that is a sign of health, ultimately. That is how we all function. Why do we believe that 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 um, whatever, that you're not a particularly terrible person, you know? We all carry a story as to why, we're, why we think that, that we are okay, there's nothing as fundamentally wrong with us. <clears throat> the person with OCD needs to go ultimately to that story that's real, you know? Because the session is not about the real self or about what is really happening in reality or at least not in any justifiable way. So, in that sense, I would not be too afraid to say like, well, okay, but this story is ultimately, this alternative story is, is a real thing. And we do that later in therapy. This module is just about identifying and assessing. And I say it again and again, it's important not to jump ahead, even though the temptation is very strong to do so when you're a therapist, when you're starting out with ICBT. You wanna like 
tell them and help them right away in one session and it's not going to work that way. You, know? you have to help them to discover it for themselves in many ways. You know? And create a room for that. Thank you. We we probably have time for one more question and Stephanie has a hand raised. So just to be clear with the counter story, we shouldn't have anything in there that's like common sense tells me this or I know this to be true or anything like that, right? Well, the counter story is just a different story that leads to a different conclusion. That's all. And yes, you can have probably common sense in there, but it's, it's just showing that, that another story is equally valid, you know, at the least. If you put more sense information in it and more reality into it, it becomes even more valid. You don't have to press that point at this point in the therapy. You know? It's just a different story. It's, a, the, it's about that stories have an effect on, the, on our behavior and emotion. That's the point. And the OCD you, story has a very negative effect. You can put things in the counter story that are like, I've locked this time, a th uh, I've locked this door a thousand times before and the lock is never broken. And that would seem to be in contrast to what you're saying. My, this Maybe this lock is broken, but that's just observing reality of lock. This, this lock a thousand times before and it still works so there, it's i'm not so like antagonistic against those sorts of like common sense appeals okay thanks You're muted, Mary. Yeah, I just noticed that. There's just a couple of minutes left. Is there any other final comments or anything before we wrap up today? This has been really helpful. Um, Teresa has been doing some demos uh, with a fake client that she's been posting in our Facebook group and she's done modules one and two so far and she's working on finishing up three. So you can look for that in the Facebook group soon if you'd like to just see this demonstrated, um, the therapist and client going through module three. Thank you so much panelists and thank you everyone for attending today. Thanks Mary and guys. <laughs> oh, someone's asking for the post to the link to the Facebook group. Ah, let me find it before. Thanks, Mary. I know Amanda had sent me the link to our trainings on Fridays, but I still haven't been able to join the Facebook group and it seems like- Okay, I just, yeah, I just dropped a link. So hopefully that will take you there. And then when you go to join the Facebook group, there are some questions you have to answer. So please answer those questions. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye, y'all. Bye.